want to begin by just going to the Lord in prayer. And uh, hopefully you have your Bible open to Mark chapter 6. That's the reason <coughs> I have the gentleman read uh, the passages to us. is So you're prepared to uh, go through the passage. And so you keep Mark chapter 6 open and we'll go through that in just a moment. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you this morning for giving us the privilege and opportunity to stand here to be able to uh, hear these songs that have been sung and to worship you and to praise you. Lord, we thank you for each and every one that is here today. You have given us the ability to be here. Lord, it is no accident. These folks could have gone anywhere, but they are here. And you've brought them here this morning for this specific purpose, to hear this message today. And so, God, we thank you for that. Lord, I realize today I stand here and I am a sinner. And, Lord, I need forgiveness of the sin that is in my life. I pray that you would show it to me. I pray that you would just place it beneath the blood of Jesus. Help us today as we prepare to go through this passage of Scripture. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark chapter 6 is a familiar story, narrative in Scripture that you no doubt have heard time and time again. Jesus taking something so simple as a young boy's lunch. John tells us that, that it was a young boy. But a young boy's lunch, and he turns it in to a miracle, one of the many miracles that Jesus had done. And I don't know how you feel about this this morning, but I love this miracle. Because so often in life, I seem like life shows up and we come up short in many areas in life, but God will always come through. And that is a wonderful promise that we have from Him. I read recently an old article from years ago in uh, the Cincinnati Enquirer, and it began like this. It said, someday there might be a utopia where people make more than they spend. Bosses will warn employees, please do not work too hard. Children will never get sick. And the cost of the average home in the tri-state area will be a little under $30,000. And the only stressed out people will be psychologists because they will have no work to do. Boy, would that not be nice if that was the world that we lived in. Well, the truth is many people today struggle just to make their mortgage payment. Uh, today, people are struggling just to make their uh, grocery payment. In fact, when you wake up tomorrow and the sun arises, you're probably going to have more problems than you did today. There's not going to be less traffic on your way to work or on your way shopping or whatever you may do, go to get lunch. There's probably going to be more traffic and, no doubt, another detour. I think you could agree that's a pretty discouraging message to hear today, but it's reality, and I think we all know that. And the reality is that we live in a world that is full of stress, a world that's full of problems and oh, definitely a world full of uncertainty. Someone said that we as Christians, we live our life like we're ducks. On the top, we are cool. On the surface, we are cool and calm and collected. But underneath, we are paddling just as fast as we can so we can stay afloat. Now, that may describe your life today. And if not today, maybe tomorrow or sometime in the future or sometime in the past. Because life is stressful. And the disciples in this passage that we read today are facing a very stressful situation. In fact, I often tell people that when it comes to life, there's three things that always give us problem. Time, not enough of it. Energy, not enough of it. And money, and most of us feel as though we do, do not have enough of it. Have you said this past week, oh, if I only had more time, I could get more done. If the day was just a little bit longer, I would be able to do more things during my day. What about your energy level? Can any of you relate to that? Seems like something I struggle with on a daily basis. Every year that I get older, my energy tank just seems to go down more and more and more. And what about money? Well, my money doesn't stretch as far as it did a year ago. For that matter, it doesn't stretch as far as it did last week. Sometimes I wonder if I'm going to have any left by the time it's all said and done. And so these things, time and energy and money, it's things that we all struggle with. Well, we find that in our passage that we read this morning. You know this miracle as the feeding of the 5,000. And let me just 
uh, let, you, let you know this, that it says it's the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, but uh, the typical culture of that day would have only counted the men. So there would have been women and there would have been children that would have been there as well. So we're talking about probably, roughly just guessing, around 20,000 people. But in this miracle, Jesus teaches the disciples something about their Christian life, and he definitely teaches us something about our Christian life. And so here we have it in this passage that we just read. Jesus is speaking to all of these people. It has come to the very end of the day. Jesus is tired. The disciples are tired. The people are tired. And some 20,000 people need to be fed, and there's no fast food restaurant that they can just walk to and get something to eat. So the question in this passage is, what are they going to do? Do the disciples pass the faith test? Do they pass the trust test? Do the disciples pass the time test? Well, most of us would probably do exactly what the disciples did in this passage. In fact, the disciples made some mistakes that you and I typically make whenever we are stressed out, when life throws different things at us, when we have decisions to make, when our plate seems to be too full, when... We really don't know sometimes what we should do. When we're short on time, when we're short on money, when we're short on energy, God can work in our life the same way that he worked in the lives of the disciples and the people that were gathered there that day as well. Now before I tell you the right thing to do, as always, I like to tell you what not to do. I give you a little negative before we end up getting to the positive. But let's go back to the text and let's stick with the text this morning and watch as this narrative unravels here. Go back to verse 35 of Mark chapter 6 and I want you to see what happens. It says, and now when the day was far spent, it's nighttime, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, this is a desert place and now the time is far past. Now, there's a couple things I want you to highlight in your Bible, or at least underscore, if you would. And the first one here to underline is where it says, the time is now far past, or the time is now spent. Because in that, we notice the very first point of something that we should not do. And this is on your outline, but I want you to write this down. Number one, what did they do? They procrastinated. The disciples had all day to prepare for this. They knew Jesus was a long-winded preacher. They knew that he taught a long time. They had all day to prepare for this, but what did they do? They put off dealing with the problem. They did absolutely nothing. Well, it's somebody else's problem, right? Now let me ask a very practical question for you this morning. Do any of you struggle with that little thing called procrastination? Putting things off that you probably should do, and you know you have time during your day to do, but you just procrastinate. Well, I only heard one amen, but I know that I'm dealing with procrastinating people this morning. There's not a doubt in my mind about that. But that's what happens when we are under pressure. When life comes at us at all angles, the best thing we generally do is just simply procrastinate. Well, there's another thing we see here that the disciples did that we should not do. Number two, they gave the responsibility to someone else. They said, this is not our problem, right? Well, go back to verse 36 of our text. They didn't just procrastinate. They actually said, this is not our problem. What did they say in verse 36? And underline these first few words. They said to Jesus, send them away. Get rid of them. That'll solve the problem. It's not our problem. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. Now that sounds like a real nice Christian thing to do. Would you not agree? What do they say? Not our problem. We're sorry that all these people are hungry, but not our problem. Out of sight, out of mind. Let's just get rid of them. It's their own fault. They should have brought their own food. Hey, by the way, Jesus, we did not ask these people to come. They came on their own free will. Now let's make this very practical and personal again. 
Do you ever ignore the problems in your life and just kind of pretend that those problems do not exist? It's not just that we have become good at Christians at procrastinating things that God wants us to take care of, but sometimes we have become masters at pretending they don't even exist. This is not a problem. This is not my problem. Well, there's a third thing that these disciples did that we should not do, and that is they worried. They simply panicked. Look at verse 37. And Jesus answered them and said, Give ye them to eat. Now you can underline the rest of this verse here. And they said unto him, Shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? Now can't you just imagine what's going through their mind? They're thinking, Jesus has lost his mind. I mean, where are we going to get the money for this? And, and anxiety kicked in. Anybody a friend of anxiety? You ever have anxiety in your life? If anxiety is not part of your life, you ought to thank God every day that you never have to experience that. Because most of the world actually does. But this situation threw these men close to Christ into overdrive and into anxiety. And they begin to think, like we do, with all these what ifs. Well, how are we going to get all of that food here? How are we going to be able to keep the food hot? How are we going to be able to get the money? Oh, by the way, who's going to clean up the mess? We don't have a health permit for this. We don't even have liability insurance. How does Jesus think that we're going to do this? Now, the interesting thing about this story to me is this. Standing next to them is a man that they know is the Son of God. A man that they have seen turn water into wine. They have seen other miracles that he has performed, and he's standing there, and they know Jesus can just snap his fingers if he wanted to, and this food could appear out of nowhere. But they're worried about where they're going to get the food. Isn't that just like us as Christians sometimes? God created us. God loves us. We serve Him, we know Him, we belong to Him, and we allow Satan to cause all kinds of anxiety to come into our life that God never wanted us to have. And so what do we do? Oh, we procrastinate. We place the responsibility on the more spiritually mature people, right? And then if that doesn't work, we do what we do best, and that is we worry. And oh, how we have become professional worriers. And you may say today, well, I can't just erase my mind. Worry is around me all the time. Do you know worry is something we choose to do? We do. We choose to worry. And it was in Scripture that I read where it says that God shall supply all of my needs. Yeah, but what if? But what if? God knows where you're at. God knows the situation you're in. He knows exactly what's going on in your life. So with that understanding, I want to give you some principles that will help us in our Christian life. Most of us can relate to the negatives, the don'ts. But what about the things that we should do? Well, here they are. First of all, we should accept responsibility. Whatever the situation is in our life, whatever God has allowed to happen in your life, wherever God has placed you at this particular time in your journey, we must come to the place as Christians where we accept the responsibility. Now, sometimes we have to ask ourselves, am I doing too much? Am I living irresponsibly? Am I living beyond my means? I can't blame other people for what I don't have. That doesn't work. But what I can do is accept responsibility and say, God, you created me. God, you know me. God, you have placed me exactly in this situation, as unpleasant as it may be. And God, you know that I'm here. And God, if you can turn a little boy's lunch and feed 20,000 people, the problem in my life is so minute. And so we have to accept responsibility for where we're at. That's where it begins. Now, here's the second thing that I want to mention. You have to gather your resources. You see, what the disciples really wanted Jesus to do was just snap his fingers and make all this go away. And Jesus did not do that. What we want Jesus to do in our life is to snap his finger, and we pray, and all of our problems go away, and we live in that area, like I mentioned 
in the introduction of the sermon where everything is just perfect and there's no problems at all. And sometimes what Jesus is saying to us is, well, let's pause for a moment. Allow me to work in this situation. Gather your resources. Because, by the way, something very interesting happened in verse 38, and I do not want you to miss this. Look at verse 38, if you will, because Jesus is telling his disciples at this point, he is saying, this is not my responsibility. This is your responsibility. And he says, he asks the question, how many loaves do you have? And he tells them, go and see. And when they knew, they said, five and two fishes. Now I present the question to you today, why did Jesus ask them to go and see what they had? Why would he do that? Could Jesus have just performed the miracle and everything have been fine? Yes, he could have. But why did he have them go and search through 20,000 people and find out who had brought their lunch that day? Well, there's a very important truth we do not want to miss here. What God wants to do in the form of whether you call it a miracle or whether you call it just God working in your life, He always wants to start with what you have. So you realize how big He really is. That God can take literally nothing and make an abundance out of it. And so at that point, the focus then becomes not on what we have done, but it becomes, the focus becomes upon God. Now let me give you the practical part to that because that is true in so many practical areas of our life. We may say, well, I don't have much talent. But do you realize what happens when we give God just the little talent that we have? God can use that. God can cause that to grow and we can use that for God's glory and for His kingdom. Maybe many of us would say, I just don't have much energy like I used to have. Well, what are you going to do, sit down and die? Why are you even here today? I mean, we got to keep going on. The best thing we can do is just keep pressing on and keep going on. That would be depressing just to think, well, I don't have any energy. I'm just going to sit in my house all day and do nothing. Took a little energy to get here today, did it not? But will God not bless us for that effort that we made in coming here and we can see God work in that? Well, that leads us to the next principle here, that we, things we should do. Thirdly, we should give God what we have. It's not just that we look around and some of us could say, well, yeah, others have more than we do, but God's not asking for that. What God is asking is for what we have. It's very interesting to me that this story is mentioned four times in Scripture. In fact, all four Gospels tell this story. But it's only in the Gospel of John that it mentions that it was a little boy that brought his lunch. Now that's interesting to me because of all of these people that happened to be there that day, some 20,000 people, it was only a little boy that thought, you know what, maybe I should pack my lunch today. That is absolutely amazing to me. You say, well, why is this story even in the Bible? Because the way that this young man gave his lunch to Jesus illustrates how you and I give in order to see what God is going to do in our life. The little things that we have, just what we have. Oh, it's easy for us to say, well, you know, if I had better health, I would serve God more. If I had more money, I would be able to, to do more. And so what's the point? Well, I think Paul said it best in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 12. In fact, look at that passage because he, he summarizes for us when we have these anxieties and we have these shortcomings in our life and we have these thoughts that we just can't serve God because whatever. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 8, 12, For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according that a man hath and not according to that he hath not. It starts with what you have. It starts with what you're willing to do. God doesn't expect you to give time you don't have. He doesn't expect you to give a talent you don't have. God doesn't expect you to give energy he don't have. But I believe God can still work in our life in extraordinary ways if we will allow him to. Well, there's a fourth principle here that I want you to notice about this little boy in the passage. 
And that is we have to give in faith. That's exactly what happened here. Do you think this young man knew what Jesus was going to do with his lunch? No. This little boy didn't hold anything back from God. He gave everything he had, all five loaves and two fishes. Now, had that been us there that day, and Jesus would have come and said, listen, I want to perform a miracle. Uh, I, I'm going to uh, do something with this, but I need you to give me everything that you have. You know what most of us would have said? We would have got very religious and we would have said, well, Jesus, I'll give you 10%. How about that? Because that's a lot. And most people don't even give that. And that's the standard the church, church uses. So let me give you that and see what you can do with that. No, Jesus didn't want 10% of this boy's lunch. He wanted it all. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. I'm not talking about somebody giving all their money away or all their money to the church. I'm speaking of nothing like that. I'm talking about devotion, devoting our life to God. And, and many times we can do that. We can say, God, I'll give you a portion of my life, but not this area. Maybe what we need to do is say, God, I want to give you every area of my relationships, every area of my hobbies, every area of my money, every area of my time. God, even my dreams that I have, I want to give those to you because, God, I do not want to do anything that you do not want me to do. Can God bless that? Well, according to Scripture, He can. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, now jot this verse down. It says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give, it, give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You've heard the term, you can't outgive God, and, and many times when people say that, they're talking about financial stuff. But listen, God does not need our money. Do you realize that? He is the owner of it all. He owns the cattle of a thousand hills, Scripture talks about. God doesn't need our money. He needs our willing vessels to say, God, I want to be used by you. Now this takes us to the fifth thing that we should do. And that is to give cheerfully. Well, that's where we may lose some of you today. We have every indication in this passage that this boy gave and gave willingly and gave cheerfully and did not hesitate at all. He recognized the need, he offered it to Jesus, and he gave with a cheerful heart. Whatever you do, whether it's your time, whether it's your talent, whether it's your money, no matter what it may be, if you can't give it with a cheerful heart, then you would be better off not to give it at all. Because God wants you to give in a willing manner. Now, Paul talked about this, the Apostle Paul did as well. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 7 and 8, jot that verse down, because here's what Paul said. He said, every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves what? A cheerful giver. You know, many people have asked me the question down through the years. They'll say things like this. It's probably one of the most common questions I have. They'll say, I feel guilty because I, I don't think I'm giving enough. And I say, well, why do you think you're not giving enough? Well, <laughs> I've heard said that you have to give this much. And I say, well, why don't you start with something that you can be cheerful about? Well, but that might not be very much. But do you realize if you're cheerful about it and you're giving with the right motives and your heart is right when you're giving that, God can bless that. And God can use that. And God can multiply that. Don't focus on the number. Focus on the heart that is giving. And that is true also in every area of your life. God, I don't have time to go do this at the church. Then don't do it. If you're going to do it and the rest of us have to face the wrath of your fury, you're not doing anyone any favors. That was supposed to be funny, but I guess it wasn't. <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one that gets the wrath. <laughs> Pastor, I love my church and I love to serve my church. And then I look at you and it just seems like somebody's about ready to run you over with a truck. And it's like, well, what's, this doesn't match up. I thought you loved your church. I thought you loved doing things for the church. Yeah, but I'm so stressed out and, and I just don't have enough time. Well, then... How about you just give God the time that you do have and do it with a joyful heart? 
do it in a cheerful manner. There's one last thing that I want to mention here in this passage. And this is something that we should do. And that is watch God multiply it. Nothing will build your faith more than watching God multiply what you give. Your time, your energy, your money, whatever it is, your relationships, your marriage, when you give it to God and you say, God, this belongs to you, I want to use this to bring honor and glory to your name. Now, if you remember, Jesus told the disciples when they came and they said, Lord, there's all these hungry people here. Jesus looked at them and he said, then go feed them. Why did he do that? He was testing them. He wanted their faith to grow. And in verse 27, it says, And Jesus looking upon them saith, With men it is impossible, but with God, for with God all things are possible. Do you know that God specializes in impossibilities? Any area of your life. Now, I'm not talking about some word of faith stuff or some name it, claim it type of stuff. I'm talking about God working real things in your life. God specializes in impossibilities in your life. For this purpose, when you see God work in that area, you can say only God could do something like this. It takes away your ego. It takes away your self-worship. And you have to give God praise and honor and glory because only God could do something that miraculous in your life. So let's get real practical here. In verse 42 and verse, verse 43 it says, And they did all eat and were filled, and they took up twelve basketfuls of fragments and of the fishes. They had more left than what they started with. Now that's the way that God can work in our life. My question for you this morning is this. What is it in your life that you need God to do a mighty, mighty work? You can call it a miracle. You can call it a great task. You can call it a great act of faith. You can call it whatever you want. But what area in your life do you drastically need God to show up and do something? Can I say this to you this morning? God can work in your life. Do you believe that? Do you believe God can work in your life? He can work in your life. He will work in your life if you are willing to serve him. Let's stand together as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for giving us this opportunity. Lord, not only to worship you and to serve you, but God, we thank you that you are good. We thank you in spite of all of our shortages in life. Lord, you're there. Lord, we thank you that we don't have to worry about tomorrow because we can trust you. And Lord, I know we live in troubling times, but as your child, you have promised that you'll take care of us. Lord, maybe today what we need to do is just say, God, forgive me for the complaining and the worrying and the anxiety, but thank you for taking care of my needs each and every day. Lord, we take so much for granted. We are here today. We have clothes on our back. We're going to go home and we're going to eat a meal. We drove here. We had transportation. God, help us to focus on the blessings in our life. And when Satan brings those thoughts to us and tries to get us to doubt, Lord, help us to realize that you can do all things. If you can turn some fish and bread and feed multitudes out of a little boy's lunch, you can definitely work miracles in our life. So, God, we pray today that you would do that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.